All right, uh, welcome everyone. This is the second um, paper session for the Viz Arts program. Good morning, uh, my name is Uta Henriks and I'm co-chairing the session together with Rebecca Shu. And we also have a co-chair, Tommaso Eli, online, um, who will share the questioning, so you'll see him very soon as well. Um, we have uh, divided up our um, works, um, so artist talks, pictorial talks, paper talks, into two different blocks, thematic blocks. So the first um, block is about mingling interfaces, and we have uh, four talks, um, three virtual talks, and, and one in-person talk. So the first talk um, is uh, about a, a piece called Wind from Bamboo, a Chinese handwriting interactive installation based on human AI collaborative font design. Um, and it's presented by Jin Song um, from the Xinxiang um, Fine Arts Institute. And I should um, tell you, so we, we will do, uh, we have group talks and you will do like a joint Q&A session um, after the first four talks. So please um, put your questions on Slido, even for the in-person attendees. And then um, Tommaso will basically moderate the questions. So, um, if we can please see the video from Wind from the Bamboo, the first one. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jin. Thanks for having me today. I'd like to share our project called Wind from Bamboo, a Chinese handwriting mingling interactive installation based on human AI collaborative font design. I come from Sichuan Fine Arts Institute. I am the co-founder of Creativity AI Club. It's a joint lab established by researchers from three universities in China and the United States. Our lab focuses on the approach of collaborative creativity between humans and AI in the field of design and art. Before the presentation, I'd like to share a story. As a Chinese mother, I check my daughter's Chinese character writing every day. In the beginning, I could check them at a glance, and my daughter trusted me. But when she not more, I had to write down and compare the characters with hers. Sometimes I made mistakes. One day she said, Mom, let's check with the dictionary. This made me feel very bad and also made me realize the problem of writing. So how long have not write characters, whether it's Chinese or English? Actually, with the popularization of computers, cell phones, and laptops, the way of character input has changed from writing on paper to typing on the keyboard. Character amnesia is getting common, especially in Chinese. In response to this problem, this project tried to help people relieve handwriting. Let me play a short video to give an overview. In the information age, the way of writing Chinese characters with strokes is gradually alienated. In response to this problem, the designer collaborated with AI to design a bamboo leaf style font. Based on the font, a mingling interactive installation was set up to help people to relive the handwriting experience, which started a virtual Chinese bamboo forest scene through the real handwriting behavior. Okay, first, let me explain why we choose bamboo as the theme of the project. Bamboo is a member of a group called the Four Gentlemen in traditional Chinese culture. Each member of the group was used to symbolize some aspect of the character of an ideal person. Many Chinese arts, such as painting, crafts, landscape design, music, and so on, use a bamboo to express integrity and tenacity. Specifically, there are two parts to the project. The first part is to create a bamboo leaf style font that integrates the bamboo leaf shape and the Chinese character structure. The second part is to build an interactive way of mingling real and virtue to interest the user's handwriting. In the first part, designers and AI complement each other's weakness and their respective advantages to produce results 
that are greater than the sum of the designs completed by designers and AI. The whole design process is divided into three steps. In the first step, the designer collected fonts as dataset A and bamboo leaves picture as dataset B. AI nerd and generated fonts based on two datasets. AI gave many unexpected results, which provide inspiration for the style of the font. In the second step, the designer observed the results through the design experience. After finding the problems, the designer adjusted the data to help AI generate results to approach the design goals. The designer and AI collaborated until suitable results appeared. In the third step, the designer selected some good generated results to optimize by hand. In order to strengthen the feature, AI learned the optimal results and generated fonts again. In conclusion, the designer and AI always reflected each other from the beginning to the end, and finally created a unique bamboo leaf style font. In the second part, we design an interactive installation to break the public's conservative impression of Chinese writing. The input of the installation is a handwritten Chinese character on paper, and the output is the immersive digital scenes. It starts the virtual sensory experience through the real handwriting behavior, achieving a mingled experience effect that cannot be achieved by a single real or virtual experience. When people press the button after finish writing, the handwriting characters will slowly appear in the virtual bamboo forest and change to the bamboo leaf style, which gets denser and drift into the bamboo forest. Although the trend of keyboard input mode cased by informatization is challenging to change, which makes people gradually alienate the handwriting mode of Chinese characters. Through the project, we still believe that Chinese handwriting will be perceived and experienced again in new ways. Thanks for listening. For more information and other projects, please visit the website of our lab. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Jin. Um, again, we will um, have a Q&R, a Q&A panel session after the first uh, four. The end of the green is an interactive website. So please um, post your questions to Jin and other speakers to Slido, and we'll come back to them um, after the first four talks. So. Um, the next piece um, is an artist talk um, called Under the Green, Visual Data Storytelling the pro the, to Process uh, of Urban CO2 Neutralization by Forests. Um, and it's presented by Lin Kui Wang from Hanan University. It's a video presentation as well. Under the Green is an interactive website that visualizes the process of urban carbon dioxide neutralization by forest. In the process of industrialization of the city, the production and living of people produce lots of carbon dioxide gases. Forests absorb this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. The soil organic carbon is decomposed by microorganisms and retained to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. This is the carbon cycling process which integrates urban and forest spaces. At a certain point in time, common absorption offsets carbon emissions, that means carbon neutrality. Micropage is a microwave of Hunan Province, China. From 1996 to 2020, through forest management and promoting the integration of urban and forest space. 
Based on forest management and economic development of Hunan, it can be divided into five regions: western, southern, central, northern, and eastern. Carbon density is an important indicator of the capacity of forests to sequester carbon. It depends on forest cover and forest box. Higher value of carbon density means greater carbon fixation capacity. Carbon density, carbon stocks, and forest cover shows an increasing trend year on year in Hunan. Western and southern Hunan have consistently higher carbon fixation capacity. Since 2001, the regions of Hunan Province has been retaining farmland to forest and participating in forest management, and carbon fixation capacity of the soil has been significantly improved. In 2008, many trees were uprooted because they could not bear the heavy snow on top and frozen to die due to the extreme cold. The associated reduction in the forest cover ultimately led to the reduced carbon stocks that eventually led to a significant decrease in carbon density. In 2014, the vigorous cultivation of IT, especially in Hongyang, Yongzhou, and Lodi, led to a large increase in afforestation. The afforestation of covered areas in Shanxi and Shaoyang led to a large increase in forest cover. As a result, the carbon density fall in 2014. However, over the bubble might to see the detailed data on the level of the carbon fixation in region for that year, and to view the dynamics of the carbon fixation capacity over 25 years. Micropage visualized the integration and exchange of organic carbon between plants, soil, and the atmosphere during the growth of the fir forest. Because of its high economic value. Transfer is widely grown in western and southern Hunan. However, the growth of the transfer trees requires nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil, and this drives organic carbon in the soil. Let's look at the process of fir trees mingling and exchanging nutrients and carbon during growth. Part of the carbon will be converted into carbon dioxide and released into the air. The retained soil organic carbon content is insufficient to compensate for the decomposed organic carbon in the commons. In the 14th year, the depletion of the soil organic carbon will reach a peak. When it comes to the 27th years, the depletion of the soil organic carbon in the transfer forest can be compensated. So, 27 years is the most appropriate time to harvest transfer trees to offset the damage to the soil organic carbon during the growth of the forest. Mingling page compares the effects of mingling plantations of fir and broadleaf species with those of pure fir stems on the soil carbon fixation capacity. The following set of comparative experiments take you through the mingling cultivation perspective. The comparative experiment below shows the mingling plantation of fir forest with broadleaf species can be proved the depletion of soil organic carbon. Mouse have over the visual elements to display detailed carbon fixation data for each component in detail. Drag the timeline to view the changes in the carbon fixation for every growth year. Experimental data shows that real mandarin Chinese fir plantation, the mixture with 20% micro material leads to greater fixation capacity and better growth of plantation. The video and description of real-life working scenario of our data provider. The above page shows in detail what we want you to convey, including the original motivation and visual style employed, why we choose raw data on forest ecology and this topic. Moreover, this page further explains the previous model's visualization content. We also express our respect for the forest ecology scientists who are rooted in mountains and dedicate to the common destiny of humanity. And. Thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Linkui.、Um, the next talk、um, is about a piece called "Super Synthesis: A Communal Synthesis," and it's.、Um, Presented by Amai Katarina,、uh, an independent artist from Chicago. It's going to be a, a virtual presentation again. 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Amey Kataria, and today I'll be presenting a summary of Supersynthesis, a Communal Synthesis, which is a pictorial paper that I submitted to this year's IEEE VIS conference. For this talk, I'll go over what Supersynthesis is, its key components, and why it's important. But before that, let me briefly introduce myself. After getting trained as an engineer and spending a short time in the industry, I pivoted to explore the intersection of art and technology. In my practice, I create experiences that reflect upon the tension between the self and the collective. A finished artifact is often a performative object made up of subsystems systematically interacting with each other. Supersynthesis is a recent project of mine, which was commissioned by MU Gallery in Chicago. It's an interactive light and sound installation that collects data through a visual interface and manifests it as a sequence of audiovisual outputs. It operates as an art installation, as well as a 24-key musical instrument developed for the public space. The first key component of this project is a two-fold visual interface. The exhibition mode is an online public interface that allows users to craft musical scores and send them to the physical installation in real time. Whereas the performance mode allows users to interact with Supersynthesis as a 24-key musical instrument. At any time, both these modes can overlap with each other to enhance the output of the piece. Another key component is a soft network architecture that enables the telepresence system for the exhibition mode. The central web server is a sequencer running in the cloud, which processes every incoming musical score created by the audience, stores it in a database, and transmits them to all the devices using WebSocket technology. I call this network phenomena communal computing. The last key component is the physical sculpture that receives each note sequenced in the cloud. Every note on corresponds to a light on and a musical note translated using three eight-channel relays and a pure data patch running on a Raspberry Pi, which drives the physical installation. Supersynthesis borrows from a rich lineage of historical works that have been participatory in nature. The consequences of these interactions may or may not be disembodied from the actual device where they are taking place. For example, Open Air by Lozano Hammer visualizes the data templates created by user interaction into a large-scale lighting system. On the contrary, Mesh Garden allows for a co-located, shared experience to collaboratively make music in real time using personal devices. Nonetheless, just like Supersynthesis, all these works utilize a visual interface that ties into the fabric of the internet to create collective mingling spaces. According to Christina Nieder, a performative object is an artifact that mediates social relationships through interaction. Supersynthesis communicates its functionality as a musical instrument through its visual interface and as an art installation through its sculptural form. With its repetitive use, one begins to make psychological connections between the data visualized through its interface and its physical consequences on the actual installation without any prior musical knowledge. Therefore, through telepresence and a feedback loop, a social causal mingling space is created for the audience who is interacting not only with the creative outputs of the other bodies, but also with the subsystematic agency of the machine. In such a stimulating space, the musical thought departs away from the formal rules of logic and makes interaction fluid and playful. In this case, a language of light and sound takes over the space. Thus, supersynthesis provokes a network effect of individuals imposing themselves on their environment and vice versa to create a communal synthesis where one collectively experiences the self and individually experiences the collective. I want to sincerely invite you to read this paper and learn more about this project. Meanwhile, let's see a short demo of Supersynthesis in action. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Amai. And um, the last but not least in this blog, we have a presentation by um, Bon Adriel Asaniero from Autodesk. And he's going to talk to us about Skyglyph's reflection on the design of a delightful visualization. All right. Um, am, I, am I on? All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bon Adriel Asaniero. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about Skyglyph's reflections on the design of delightful visualizations. I am a senior research scientist at Autodesk, um, but this project was something that I made when I was still an intern over there in 2020 uh, with my then PhD supervisor, Sheila Carpendale, and my mentors at Autodesk. All right. Um, Cool. Um, with my mentors at Autodesk, George Fitzmaurice and Justin Mataika. Okay, so I assume that many of us in here are visualization designers or at least have an interest in knowing how to design visual representations. And we know how to make these. We have a lot of research that talks about um, how to create representations and visualization tools for analytical tasks, uh, maybe even abstract tasks and different data sets to support. However, I am more interested in making non-conventional data representations, perhaps some that may inspire delight. The thing though, um, I mean, just look at the submissions that we have at the VizAP 2022, right? These are very cool um, data visualizations or sonifications, different types of artistical stuff that may go beyond analytical tasks. And they tend to go into this wave of data humanism, which is a movement that tries to bring back data into a more personal realm. All right. But in most cases, the, the design of these non-conventional representations um, may be a little bit individualized and... Oh, third mic. <laughs> okay. But in most cases, the design of these non-conventional representations involves processes and you know, design intentions that may be very um, personal to the designers themselves. And they're what I'm calling highly individualized processes. And so a lot of us are often left to wonder, like, how are these actually made? Uh, you know, like, and I feel like with the emergent views from data humanism and the trends of people encountering data vis in their daily lives, it's actually becoming more important for us to know how these hidden processes are actually made. And I would hope that the Viz community becomes more open to this. So as an example, um, I present in this pictorial the process of how we designed and implemented a visualization that uses non-conventional representations to visualize data. And, you know, like, just an example, like in when I was doing this as an intern at Autodesk, uh, there was this whole push for visualizing organic data, which is most of the time just forgotten after it gets posted somewhere in a repository. Uh, however, these files like PowerPoint slides or other things um, may have a lot of useful information in them and they could be worth exploring too. Uh, and you know, maybe sometimes they could lead into generating new ideas or even finding connections across the company, like say different authors of these uh, files. But the question we had then was, how do we make this more interesting uh, rather than just simply using a search browser or a file viewer? Because um, you know, this isn't exactly a task that like employees are expected to have, right? So we wanted to do something that is more fun uh, and may induce serendipitous browsing. So our approach involved designing a data visualization tool that can be placed in the hallway of the office or online. And we took about 3,500 presentation slide decks um, that are posted by employees on our repository. Uh, and we decided to use some playfulness, like artistic and personal visualizations uh, to visualize the data. So here is what we did, uh, come up with. <laughs> so this is Skyglyphs a visualization that uses whimsical metaphors of uh, balloons floating and mingling in the sky. And the idea is to leverage people's curiosity as an entry point to the visual exploration. And you may hear me refer to it as delightful visualization. And this is through our intentional use of say vibrant colors, uh, elegant shapes and fluid animations to induce this pleasant feeling of satisfaction or delight when people are using the visualization. 
And what you're seeing in here is that each hot air balloon is a presentation slide deck. And the older the deck is, the farther they would look into and fade it into the screen, whereas newer slides will look bigger and closer. And the color bands on each of these balloons depicts the different Autodesk products that are mentioned in them. And as you can see in here, each of the balloons have this interactive tool tip, the tool tip that actually allows you to kind of browse for more similar objects. And um, I've kind of hidden the, <laughs> um, the stuff in here because it's like proprietary data, right? So. There's also a spike glyph in the middle, which is a modified or anchored four-point star glyph that depicts numeric uh, metadata. So the top shows the number of slides, the left shows the number of products mentioned, the right shows the amount of company relevant keywords, and the bottom shows the amount of buzzwords and other keywords mentioned in the slide deck. And the goal for this glyph is not so people can accurately compare these numeric data, uh, data attributes, but as a way to generate interest through these ever-changing uh, sets of shapes. But of course, we also implemented basic features like grouping of data points uh, using data attributes like the products mentioned, uh, the person who shared it, uh, keywords and buzzwords, and of course, we also allowed people to sort uh, the balloons based on the numeric attributes. Okay. So when you have a lot more data points that go beyond the screen, uh, you can go to the overview which allows you to see more data points because Skyglyphs is kind of a unit visualization after all. And you can still make groupings and such which will remain when you go back into the normal view. And just to add some more fun interactions, we also implemented a popping feature uh, where if you long press on a balloon, uh, it will start to expand and show a preview of its inner contents. And if you keep pressing on it, it will just pop. <laughs> and then it will reveal its um, individualized uh, contents. So that was the current uh, implementation of Skyglyphs, but I would like to focus um, on not just on its features, but also on the design process that we took to create the delightful visualization. So basically, um, how we took the inspiration of hot air balloons and other balloons floating in the sky as the delightful metaphor. So I encourage you to read the pictorial because we illustrate it more in there and explain in detail why we choose the balloon metaphor and how we developed its design. Like say, for instance, we added our low fidelity storyboards as well as maybe sequential sketches um, that eventually became features of the implemented visualizations. And from reflecting on our own process, we illustrate how an inspiration just for an example here, a flower, can be abstracted, uh, abstracted to its essential forms like flower head will have uh, the petals, the leaf, maybe the stem, uh, as well as maybe behaviors, you know, like maybe the flowers can sway through the wind, things like that. And these basic shapes are, you can then map these to you know, our visual channels or visual variables, um, like positions, length, color, which then gives you a representation. However, we also have to realize that it's not just the shapes and the forms that is important, but the overall theme and look and feel of the, uh, the visualization um, actually affects how people can perceive your data. Which, as you can see in here, these are two illustrations of flowers, but both of them evoke very different affect from each other. And either can be more appropriate than one another. Like, Say, for example, if you're using uh, a more somber data set, you'd probably go with the darker theme rather than the happy looking one. <laughs> all right. So yeah, this all comes down to a reflection on our own process. And our goal isn't to prescribe rules, um, but to share a perspective on how to create non-traditional visualizations. Because as, as I said earlier, these are very individualized way of designing visual representations. And this, in fact, is very personal to me. Um, and it also evolves through time. Uh, and if you're interested, I actually go more in depth on this topic with other visualizations that I designed in my thesis, um, which got an honorable mention award from VGTC. Uh, it's kind of like a pictorial thesis, really. And I'm kind of glad that VGTC was like, oh, let's give him honorable mention. All right, but that bring, brings me to the end of my talk, and I'm happy to answer questions later on in the panel. Thank you all.
Thank you very much, Bon, and congratulations again on the honorable mention um, of your thesis. I would now like to invite all the speakers um, back here on stage. Um, could we switch to the Zoom call? Um, perfect. So we have all speakers. We are unfortunately missing uh, Ninkui, the author of Under the Green, for some reason. I'm not sure why she's not here. We tried to reach her um, during the talks. Maybe she will join us in a second. Um, but I'll hand it over to Tommaso, who will chair the um, Q&A panel now. All right. Thank you very much, Uta. Can you hear me OK from the room? Yep. Yes, perfect. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks for having me here. Um, so uh, the first question is for Zen, a wind from ba the bamboo. So can you provide more details on the collaborative process between the AI and the font designer? In the sense, how did the font designer's choices influence the AI process and vice versa? Oh, sorry, Zen, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay, thank you. So in this work, we see AI as a partner um, with uh, another design experience. So first, we let the AI generate a font based, um, based on the data, but we find some shapes or some, some um, colors we don't like. So we will... Um, delete them from the font and we um, draw the new features. We think something is um, just like the bamboo leaves more. So we give the AI the idea. So we must, we should uh, to emphasize the feature like this and they will fit the hand drawing font to, font to the AI again. So the process is like a battle. Uh, we battle with, with the AI or collaborate with the AI. So sometimes we, uh, the designer, surrender, but sometimes the AI is surrender. So it's very interesting um, process. Yeah. All right. Thank you very yeah. much. So next question, uh, it's for um, Ami Kataria. So um, we wanted to know more about uh, your installation and in particular, how did people reacted to it? Um, which music did they try to, to make or maybe to compose? And uh, how long did they, did they stay interacting with it? Thanks for the question. Um, can you guys hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Great. Um, so th those were a lot of questions. I'll try to answer them quickly. I think the interactions were were quite interesting. It was the first time that I was kind of putting the piece in the in the space in a physical space. So um, I think the attention spans were very short. Um, people kind of interacted with it, and then uh, they kind of moved on to the next thing. Since there were multiple interfaces, I kind of showed people both the interfaces, the performance mode, as well as like the exhibition mode. But overall, I feel like the attention span was actually fairly short, um, just because so many other people were kind of trying things and the, the inputs were kind of overlapping on top of each other. So after some time, people were just like, OK, I think it's just easier and more uh, aesthetic to just listen to the experience and, and enjoy the like the light experience. So I feel um, the interaction was short lived. And apart from that, I feel uh, like depending on both the interfaces, people were approaching it differently. For example, for the performance mode, people really try to play it like a keyboard and they try to make chords and, and press notes in sequence. Whereas the exhibition mode was a little bit more stochastic. That's in that uh, the, the interface took more attention and people played more with the interface without really paying much attention to the sound. So I, I think that balance uh, to achieve between what importance the interface gets versus the the physical output was was something is something that I'm kind of still exploring. Right, thank you. So maybe next question is for uh, Bon as in Nero. So it's something about uh, metaphors. So um, the question is: Did the choice of a balloon metaphor 
have all to do with the choice between spiky slash convex, such as flower petals, or soft slash concave shapes. So what are other metaphors that did you consider in your process? So, um, yeah, actually, so when we were developing this metaphor, we did choose uh, at the beginning, like a lot of other um, things. Like say, for example, we, we, of course, the flower was brought up. We also thought about the fish tank metaphor where you have fishes going into these tanks and maybe you have corals, things like that. Um, in, in the end, I personally choose uh, or chose uh, the balloon metaphor because it was the one that I was really inspired with, um, you know, like seeing the, I just thought the metaphor really lends into kind of other things, like say, you know, like when you have groupings, uh, we already have visualizations, like say circle packing, um, which kind of allows you to create something that is sort of novel, but still tie it into pre-existing um, representations that people might be already familiar with. So while we're using it for PowerPoint slide decks and PowerPoints will have maybe another layer underneath it, um, which is the, the slides, the individual slides, um, it still kind of has that hierarchy, right? And then maybe later on you can like start doing this where it's like, oh, the balloon, which is a circle, has stuff inside and maybe you, you know you can pop it versus say if it's um, uh, at least for me like when I'm thinking like if it's a fish like I don't want to pop a fish right like um, or um, it, it doesn't or at least like during a time when we were sketching it didn't feel like um, being able to find the slides within the the metaphor of the fish didn't quite work well so we so we use the balloon metaphor I hope that answers the question but. yeah I guess so um, we have another question for you, actually. So stay uh, close to the microphone. So um, someone is asking, I really like the concept of delightfulness. So do you think it can also be applied in a more serious context where you want people to take, to take action, for example, climate change, or in a professional context where it is less about serendipitous encounters and I would say more about uh, efficiency? Maybe not so much about efficiency. Uh, uh, this is something that we really want people to just be curious about, and then you know, when when they look into it, it it's kind of hard to actually browse for the the individual items inside of it. But maybe there's a way to to make um, to make that more efficient later on. But I would say that the concept of delightfulness would actually really help in other um, areas as well. Like say, for example, in climate change. Um, at least personally, a lot of the things that I encountered all online are like climate doom and doom and gloom, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, if you want to be doing something that's maybe a bit more climate positive, uh, where you're looking at, say, you know, oh, we, we're actually having uh, more, more and more green energy sources of energy that is being created, I think you may be able to use like something that is a more delightful metaphor uh, versus more somber ones. Um, but if going back into the, the like the more professional settings, I actually think that um, while maybe skyglyphs isn't the metaphor that you should go to in for that um, for professional settings, I would say that you can still have that you know pleasant feeling of satisfactions when interacting with data online. Like I don't think that just because data analysts are using your tool, it has to be like plain and boring. Um, they are still people, they could still have, um, you know, some satisfaction when uh, looking at their own data, uh, but yeah. Can I can I actually ask a follow-up question? Um, um, because like you are heavily working with metaphor, but I was actually like giving the question to uh, Jin and uh, Mai. Like, does it apply to more abstract um, visualizations like Amai's um, installation? Like Amai and Jin, would you consider your installations like delightful visualizations or do they include that kind of concept? I'm just curious to expand that beyond the idea of like more concrete metaphors, I guess. I can probably say say something to that. 
Yeah, I think it, it does. Like, for example, I was working with the metaphor of a wave. Um, that's what I took and I abstracted the elements of the wave and I kind of broke them down into individual lights. And then the, the interface that I was developing was working through the metaphor. But I think after doing some user testing, um, the, the, some of the parts are kind of understood by, by people, but some of the parts are kind of missed. Uh, that's why I was also curious about Skyglass that did people really interact with the interface to go under the depth and, and read the slides or did it just become like a playful thing? I think in my opinion, with the piece that I made, it was kind of both. Uh, I feel like some people were, were really interested in um, exploring like the, the idea of the wave through that. It, almost they were thinking about it as, as an education element, even though there was no... Uh, intent like that um, but some people also just enjoyed the playfulness of the interface and how like the, like how it stochastic and random it was but also it was delightful and hearing so I think the the element of delightness I think is great and always uh, I feel like is is something that binds the interest of the audience to the piece be it through the interface or be it through the aesthetics and I think the metaphor overall I feel the, the metaphor of the wave helped me stay with the project a little longer. So I think with the term, with, with sky glyphs, the metaphor of this uh, hot air balloon gives you like an anchor point, I feel, in my opinion, that helps you kind of create a framework for your project. And similarly for, for super synthesis, waves and the shape of a wave became like a, a framework for the project to kind of build upon. Thank you so much. So I think in the interest of time, we should switch to the... Oh, we have two more minutes. Okay. Do we have more questions, Tomaso? No, what is just to offer Zeng the, the opportunity to also address uh, um, the, the questions about the lightfulness for her work. Yeah, yes. So for, for, for our work, uh, I think the, the, the value for the work is for children to know uh, before the iPad, before the iPhone, uh, there are so many interesting handwriting input the character uh, on the paper. Don't be, um, so that's for for because Chinese character is different from the uh, Western uh, font. There are you know there are uh, about uh, sixty um, six thousand uh, characters in one font. So the AI for the Chinese font is to improve the uh, design pro um, efficiency to let people to make the font easily. And for the children to know the Chinese font uh, to, you know, different ways. So in this way, so I think maybe in, in Western world, the AI for the font design in um, in not um, same as in China. In China, so uh, that's 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 my opinion. All right. Thank you very much. So I guess uh, we don't have time for any other questions. Can you confirm, Uta? Uh, I think we should move on to the All right. presentations. But let's thank the speakers again. And just talk from here, right? Uh, all right, now we move on to uh, the second group of today's talk, uh, which we organized under uh, Ying Yu from San Diego State University. She will be talking about her project, Soft Bus and Octo Anemone. You can play the video. Hi. My name is Yin Yu, and I'm an assistant professor at the San Diego State University School of Art and Design. Today, in this video, I present my artwork titled Soft Voice, a morphing artificial skin for enhancing audiovisual experience. This project was supported by the Siemens grant from the Media Arts and Technology Program at UC Santa Barbara. Sound, the material of music, touches our skin, penetrates our bones, and vibrates with our surrounding environment. 
We listen to sound, recording sound, and create sounds with new technologies. However, current audiovisual performance mainly focuses on human aura and visual perceptions. What if our body and skin could help people to experience the sounds from new dimensions? The goal of this project is to enhance audiovisual experience by reimagining our human skin through soft wearable robotics. Softwalls is an artificial skin morphing its appearance by sound information. The title was inspired by the British fashion designer Alexander McQueen's 2001 spring show, Walls. And this work is my salute to him. The realization of soft walls has three main components: sound information, electronic system, and artificial skin. Sound material in this system is the input data to control the wearable device. During the pandemic, I decided to record sounds at home. My kitchen became the source of inspiration. I used a big container filled with water to record sound sample using a hydrophone. After selecting four sound material from the samples, I then used a music synthesizer module called Morphogene to transform the sound by changing its time scale, speed, and splices. The four morphed water sound material activated the four layer of feathers, which is blue, green, orange, and red. The electronic system contains hardware components such as microcontrollers, palms, and valves. I use other food circuits playground express, a Python-based microcontroller to program the system. The system converts the sound information into real-time data to enable the airflow to the desired directions. In an exhibition setting, this system can be transformed into an interactive installation where four microphones capture sounds from different directions to activate each layer of the feather. Finally, for the artificial skin, I fabricate with a skin-safe silicon rubber. The shape of the module is inspired by birds. The ratchet is used for connecting the tube system, and the right pouch is the inflation mechanism. This actuation combines the force of air pressure and gravity. By folding the actuator, the feather arranged towards downwards due to the gravity. When activating the actuator, the feather lifts upwards, and the blood beneath each layer of the skin becomes visible. Softwalls, a morphing artificial skin, changes appearance by sound information. It suggests an interactive experience between the audio information and our human perceptions. All right. Um, the third project, Beyond the Human Perception, by Maria Costan. Uh, let me try. Uh, Maria 
Castellanos Vicente uh, from Oslo Metropolitan University, Norway. perception is the next step of our previous work because we are really interested in the capabilities of other living beings like plants to perceive things that humans cannot. We have been using our sensor Chlorophylla 3.0, a sensor that allows us to measure the electrical oscillations that take place into the plants. We realized that these vibrations depend on the surrounding of the plant like changes in temperature, sound, CO2, proximity of other plants, proximity of humans, etc. And we can register the immediately changes into plants. We record their four short concerts for plants and humans, where we register all the data for the two living beings. The key of this artwork is the data and how we process this data to transform into a video installation. On the one hand, we measure the electric vibrations of plants with our sensor. And on the other hand, we record EEG waves in humans. However, these two measurements are very different and we cannot compare each other. Human data and plant data are able to compare each other. This data can also be displayed graphically, since the algorithm that we developed that allowed the audience to see the data through the shape of a little spheres that are moving within the geometric shape of a torus. Each little sphere represents each recorded data. The graphic representation of human data and plant data can be seen simultaneously in a video allowing the audience to think patterns by comparing both living beings' reactions to the live music. After this research, we think that maybe plants and humans are not such different as we usually think, and maybe the key is to looking for a language beyond humans to promote the communication with other species. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, uh, effective hand sculpt glyph forms for engaging and expressive scientific visualization by Stephanie Zeller from University of Texas at Austin.
All right, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Zeller and uh, I'll be talking to you for a bit about our paper, Affective Hand Sculpted Glyph Forms for Engaging and Expressive Scientific Visualization. So affect has been defined in the literature as the myriad ways in which we respond emotionally to objects and environments. Affect correspondingly plays a significant role in communication, engagement, and problem solving for all categories of visual imagery. The emergent affective quality of any image composed of specific color, shape, form, composition, and textural com properties amplifies and moderates our sense-making about its content. There's a rich history of employing affect theory in visualization to consider important aspects of empathy, trust, and connection in viz design. Bartram et al. and later Anderson et al. identified features of affective color palettes for categorization and in information and geographic visualizations. Scientific visualizations contain multiple, often co-located components that also contribute to affect in addition to complex color properties. Glyphs are one such component. However, there is yet little to no research investigating how object properties related to form or shape and texture contribute to affective impressions in the context of SciViz, particularly for abstract forms. The motivation of this work was therefore to explore, building on the work in color and affect, how we might begin to study the complex affective assemblages produced by abstract glyph objects encoding data structures in digital space. Traditional SciViz applies basic geometric forms, spheres, cubes, rods, cones, and arrows to delineate attributes of point data. The selections in commonly used Viz software, like Paraview, limit users to these four options. Our prior work found that generating glyphs using clay and the human hand drastically increased the range of possible glyph forms and their qualities, and therefore the number and type of possible data encodings. To understand how these hand-created forms produce affective responses and which attributes contributed to these responses, we conducted two sets of studies using two different sets of glyphs. We drew first from the categories in the PAD model of affect, asking participants to place glyph images in each category based on feeling. We found that these categories were too complex and restrictive, and further, that our initial set of glyphs was too anthropomorphic, which heavily skewed category placement through biases attached to each form's real-life analog. In order to achieve better distribution and consistency of results, we generated a set of 87 hand-created clay glyph forms according to prior work in design, gestalt, and affect theory. We began with sets of spheres, cubes, cones, and rods to sculpt the second set of forms, drawing on design practice involving both the standard elements of design theory, line, shape, form, and texture, and employing an iterative exploratory method building up from the most basic forms and compositions. We extrapolated from these shapes, creating a variety of forms incorporating gestalt principles, enclosure symmetry and continuity, and affective principles, pointiness, curvature, and texture. We arrived through this process at three key taxonomic axes, curvature, profile complexity, and texture. We conducted a second study based on our pilot results, asking participants to place the new glyph images within a simplified two-dimensional affect space, using colloquial terms for ease of interpretation. We amalgamated the complex set of results across valence and arousal categories for each of the 87 glyphs by relative percentage use, including instances when participants placed a glyph form in a neutral position on the axes. We found that roundness, angularity, complexity, and simplicity influence affective response, evidenced by the distribution of quadrant placements of diverse forms. Further, these aspects combine in specific ways to produce specific results. The more round and simple a form, the more likely it will receive a low arousal, positive valence placement. The more angular and complex, the more likely the form will receive a high arousal, negative valence placement. The more anthropomorphic a form appears, the greater the biases introduced to their placement along the axes. Many participants commented that the forms were beautiful, warm, interesting, relatable, and strange. Most assumed that the forms were real in some sense, that they existed in the physical world as tangible objects with materiality, size, and weight. 
The knowledge that they were not computer generated appeared to further interest and gratify many participants who proceeded with the task with a clear idea concerning their affect. Further, the consistency and therefore predictability of form placement decreases with the complexity of the form's profile. A majority of forms placed in negative quadrants lack the gestalt characteristic of enclosure. Many had long, spiky, or angular tendrils, holes, multiple distinct components, indicating that two separate objects had been brought together or were incomplete in some manner. Many shapes placed most often in negative quadrants were asymmetrical. In contrast, many of the forms placed most often in positive quadrants were highly symmetrical and enclosed or complete and unbroken. There's no singular high confidence predictor of affect placement, but rather the components of form qualities produce affects specific to the emergent results of those components. In order to direct this affect towards specific ends, design, gestalt properties, and communicative intent must be carefully considered. Further, as large multivariate simulation data continues to increase in size and complexity, a broader, more diverse, and more expressive visual lexicon is required to produce both analytically and communicatively useful visualizations. Teasing apart and testing the many factors at play here will require the development of new testing methods, perhaps based in part on artistic design theory principles and drawing from post-humanist approaches to affect. Though preliminary and exploratory, this work has opened the door to considerable future investigations of shape, materiality, association, color, holistic design analysis, and methodology approaches. Uh, thanks so much for your time, and I'll be happy to take questions during the panel section. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, now we're gonna uh, enter the discussion session. And uh, Tommaso, I'll let you take it away. For all those amazing presentations, yes, everyone. Michael and Stephanie, please get on stage.